Welcome to the Open Mic Podcast Show with Mike Midgley. Hey, and welcome to the Open Mic Podcast. On today's episode, I'm excited to be covering the topic of decision making. Now, today's influencer guest is Dr. Gleb uh, Saspersky from Disaster Avoidance Experts, and Gleb is based out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, as much as I practice like Gleb, I didn't quite get it right live on air, uh, <laughs> no. but welcome to the Open Mic. It's an absolute pleasure to host you today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for hosting me. No big deal. You're not the first uh, podcast <laughs> interviewer to get my name not completely correct. Yeah, but uh, I keep going with it. Sapruski is where I need to be. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep going with that one. And, you know, for our listeners as entrepreneurs, uh, this is a podcast that I'm super excited about for a number of reasons, guys. And we're going to be talking about decision making, um, making the right decisions in the right formats. And um, I want to start the top of the show, and I don't know if this is relevant today, Gleb, um, you know, but I used to be, uh, I used to hire a non-exec when I worked in the public companies, and he was the ex-CEO uh, of a, uh, as, as a, um, a major DIY chain called Wix. Uh, a guy whose name was Bill McGrath, and uh, Bill always used to say to me, um, Mike, I, as long as you've thought about it, and as long as you've put the effort in, and as long as you've put the, you know, the correct due diligence in, he says, I will always back you for making a bad decision than indecision. And he says, indecision kills businesses. And obviously, Bill grew up in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s in the public companies. Um, and I'm learning this in the late night, oh, sorry, early 2000s. And um, I'm just wondering, is a bad decision better than indecision? Uh, and I know that's off script. I'd just love to get your take right at the top of the show on that one and see if it's still as relevant today because it always sticks at the <laughs> back of the mind. And it's something I cover in my coaching with my clients. And I still say that. So, uh, with your you know expertise and knowledge i would love to get your take on is um you know a bad decision you know as long as it's correctly thought through is a bad decision better than indecision well if you can ask boeing when it made a decision to go forward with a 737 max and i'm sure they <laughs> the leadership thought that they thought it through but clearly they did not do a good <laughs> job of thinking it through right yeah, so, absolutely I mean, Look at what happened with WeWork and its IPO. Yeah, wow. The leadership of the WeWork thought it through. And then, you know, they were, used to be worth $75 billion before the IPO. And now WeWork is worth about $7.5 billion. Yeah, so, so major, that's one of the biggest uprises and crashes. If you haven't checked out the WeWork example. So it's a business model that looks a little bit like Regis guys, you know, the Regis office space. And uh, wow, that, yeah. that was some crazy thing. Did, did, I think the CEO eventually resigned. Didn't they move him on after oh, no, the CEO was bought out for okay. about for about two billion dollars. Yes. So he made he made that his golden parachute was lovely, but uh, it was not lovely for all the investors who lost a lot of money. Absolutely. So this is and this is the problem that we leaders tend to be greatly overconfident about the quality of their decision making, especially in more complex decisions. So if you've thought it through, that does not necessarily mean that you're right. Absolutely. One of the biggest things about leaders that they need to do in order to make the right decisions, the big decisions right, is that they need to get outside input. Yeah. And not getting outside input, that's one of the actual biggest problems because leaders think that they know how to do the challenging things. But the biggest decisions, like mergers and acquisitions, like going public, like launching a major new product like the 737 Max, that is when you're most likely to be wrong because yeah. you don't do this frequently, but it feels like the same kind of decision that you do frequently, like, I don't know, looking for your email and deciding what's spam or not, right? <laughs> or, you know, looking at a profit and loss report and immediately seeing what makes sense, you know, are you actually making money or not? That's an easy, quick thing to do and you feel confident in it. The same confidence extends to major decisions, but it shouldn't. Yeah, so that's absolutely. the problem with no, I know I appreciate your input on there. And as usually we go off script on the show, as you know, but uh, it's not often you get to ask somebody with the experience of uh, uh, Gleb on this subject. So uh, a little bit of abuse of power there on the show uh, from my side, Gleb, by asking you uh, that question. Sorry, apologies. But if you want to learn a little no bit more about Gleb, um, head over to disasteravoidanceexperts.com or you can head over to LinkedIn, which is Gleb's for, uh, preferred channel, um, and you can just put in there uh, Gleb. 
uh, Gleb Sapersky. And we'll put those show links in there. Uh, Gleb's also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And again, we'll put those in the show notes. So if you're driving, you don't have to worry. You can just simply click the link below and head over and look at the work that we do. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk a little bit about your background, Gleb. And, um, you know, I know you talk about the mission, uh, you know, to protect for leaders from dangerous judgmental errors and, and the things around that. So why don't you want to know and share with the, you know, share with the listeners, how did that mission start? Sort of what drives you to be passionate about this so much? And just tell us a little bit about, you know, how you, you know, how you landed on this path, if that makes sense. Well, what actually drove me was seeing my parents making some really seriously bad decisions with each other. <laughs> so this was, uh, and this wasn't kind of business decisions, it was financial mostly. Yeah. So what happened was that, you know, my mom liked to buy nice clothing and my dad was kind of a cheapskate. <laughs> so she, you know, he'd go out, uh, she'd go out and buy, you know, t- of a dress that's worth 50 pounds and then you know come back home and my dad would yell at her that no dress should be worth over 20 pounds you know <laughs> so that was a kind of lots of fights lots of conflicts already as a kid i saw that, that was not helpful that was kind of dumb it was not not the right decision so that was already something that was interesting for me but and impacting my life but the worst part was when my dad so he was a real estate agent and he yeah. had a variable salary based on commissions and there was about a six month period where he made a lot of money but he hid it from my mom said he made very little money probably because he didn't want her to spend on clothing (laughs) there's a distrust there straight away though isn't there that's the yeah exactly so he actually bought an apartment elsewhere and leased it out to some folks now in a couple of years once my mom found out that was a huge big blowout fight it was kind of a disaster for our family because my parents actually ended up separating for a while and i lived with my mom i saw my dad really rarely and that really impacted me as a kid Mm, and already seeing that sort of decision making really drive my family apart it really made me wonder why are we not taught anything about how to make good decisions people just the only thing people say is go with your gut follow your intuitions and whatnot people aren't taught about how to make good decisions my parents never sat me down and told me here's how you decide kiddo and you know schools they teach you about geography they teach you about math they don't teach you about decision making right but decision making is so fundamental to everything we do this is something so important to teach so I decided to study this and figure out what's going on. And when I started studying this, that's when I started seeing how bad our decision actually making actually is. If you look at, let's say, a startup failure rates, within the first five years, about half of all startups will fail. Yep. And that's been consistent over the last several decades when, yeah, since we have yeah, statistics. I, 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 on some, yeah, yeah, because I think yeah. it goes about it either even post uh, Great Depression sort of stats, that doesn't exactly, it? You know, that exactly. Happen. And within the first 10 years, about two thirds will fail. Within the first 15 years, about three quarters will fail. And that's been consistent, you know, keeping doing the same decision making and thinking it will do, you will do differently. That's kind of the definition of insanity, right? So businesses fail and large businesses fail as well. I mean, we saw Boeing, we saw WeWork. Now there was a study done from 1991 to 2007 on large companies in the United States that failed. Companies that had over $500 million in in revenue per year, 423 companies. The study found that 46% of them failed purely due, they went bankrupt, purely due to strategic decision-making that was terrible by the leadership, like the decision-making of Boeing and WeWork, similar decision-making. I mean, one classic example is Polaroid. So for those remember Polaroid now shake it like a Polaroid picture right now Polaroid was looking at the digital camera growing more and more popular clearly more popular in the early 1990s and Polaroid was thinking uh, and was analyzing its figures it saw that its gross profit margins on photographic film is 60 percent on digital cameras it's 38 percent and it decided to keep investing uh, into photographic film not go into digital cameras well it found that 60% of nothing is still 60% or uh, is still zero, you know, zero. Yeah. is still zero that's that's zero so it went bankrupt in 2001 yeah. by contrast fujifilm was facing the same sort of situation in the early 1990s 
same difference in profit margins. But Fuji saw that, hey, clearly digital is going to get more and more popular. So it's squeezed its film business and invested heavily into digital. Yeah. And it's still around. It's still doing quite well. So yeah, and similar similar situations with Blockbuster, wasn't it? Where oh, they, yes. had the, they had the opportunity, to, was it to buy Netflix or, or something like live they TV did. or something? And they turned it down because they felt that people wanted to have that experience of driving out to the store, looking through the, the you know the aisles of either cassettes or DVDs, <laughs> then driving all the way back where you know today you can sit on the TV, uh, you, sit, you know, sit on the on your local you know your furniture, click a button, download a movie, and boom. And wow, so I, I, you know that's a big part because as a kid growing up in the eighties, we used to go to the local video store, and then yeah. we used to get fined if we didn't take it back because it was. I late remember that. Things like that. Yeah, and you know, and there was that little, and there was that little section of the store that's adult only that you as a kid really want to go to <laughs> and you could never get there but but ultimately whilst it was very very popular because it was hey that we've actually got a vhs video recorder as well which yeah. i don't think we even got till about 1984 or 85 which was way <laughs> later but um but but ultimately it was an experience but the the, the world changed and experiences change you know like you said yeah. whether it's whether it's the polaroid whether it's it, 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 it's blockbuster example um and you know i i mentioned right at the top of the show I've got a lot of affection for Bill McGrath, the CEO, you know, the ex Wix guy. Um, and, you know, he, he came across a lot of um, analogies that he used to use to try and describe situations in businesses. And one of the things that you said earlier is about the leadership at the top. And yes. he always used to say companies rot from the top, you know, the yes. rot from the top down, which is leadership. You know, the strategies are wrong. It comes mm -hmm. into the middle management. The middle management don't know what's going off. Then the employees and, and it goes down. And I think, Absolutely. you know, some of these figures you shared with us, you know, 523 companies, 46% fairly rate in South 50 years. That's huge, especially at the revenue. It's, huge. it's a lot of unemployment. It's a lot of gaps in the market. And, um, you know, when you look back, you really question, can somebody really make such a bad decision? But <laughs> I'm assuming we're going to talk about this later, but it's not necessarily just one decision. It's maybe accumulation of decisions that maybe you know uh, mm -hmm. com, you know combine and, and, and to, you know to contribute to that. You know, it depends on the, it depends on the situation. So with Polaroid, it was actually one big decision. Right. With many others, so with Boeing, it was more a combination of decisions that decreased their culture of safety and focused on a culture of uh, finances. And yeah. that so that was an accumulation of decisions. Whereas with Polaroid, Polaroid. it was one. Major Major decision of strategically took it in a very bad direction. Yeah, and it's amazing with Boeing, isn't it? Of all the companies, oh, yes. part of the original contractors to NASA for the space race in the you know late fifties, early sixties, and you know for that, you know, never mind measure twice, cut once. <laughs> it's measure a hundred times and cut once, yes. or measure a thousand yeah. times and cut once at that level. And for a business like that to potentially. Uh, move away, you know, like you say that it's concentrating away from that safety. You know, it, it's well, it has been catastrophic and horrible situations. People lost their lives and such. You know, I, I don't know if there's been three. Is it been two or three major accidents with that seven three seven Max now? Yeah, there were two. Uh, there were two accidents. Three hundred and forty six people lost their lives. Yeah, terrible and. The cost to Boeing, direct costs, are over $20 billion. Uh, and uh, the, of course, the indirect costs are much higher because yeah. of what you are exactly saying, Mike, is the reputational damage. Yep. The Boeing will never recover its reputation for safety. And that is a huge, huge blow. That's a huge loss yeah. that Boeing will never recover reputationally from. Yeah, and it's a great intro to the show. And thanks for sharing some of those examples. That's amazing. So tell us a little bit more about the featured work. Uh, listeners, uh, um, Greg has a doctorate. He's an author. He's been on um, and is a thought leader and contributor to uh, many leading publications. I think over 400 articles, 350 mm -hmm. interviews, Fast Company, CBS News, Time, Business Insider, uh, to name but a few uh, of, of the most popular ones. Um, and I suppose having featured at that level um you know just tell us a little bit more about the way you approach those thought leadership contributions uh, obviously about making the right decisions is the key message i suppose but you know what, what do those articles look like if people want to go and read them what could they expect to get out of them have you got a varied range of topics that you're talking in and around this core subject or, or is there something specific that you're trying to get across uh, you know for business leaders what my focus is when I write these articles in my newest book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best yes, Decisions yeah, to Avoid yeah. business, business Disasters, 
I focus on the actual problems that business leaders are experiencing. So for example, we talked about Boeing. The, there's a specific type of error that Boeing made, which is called the which is called the normalcy bias. So the normalcy bias is a cognitive bias. Cognitive biases are a series of dangerous judgment errors we make because of how our minds are wired. So Boeing fell into a typical trap that many older companies experienced once fall into. They anticipate that the past will inform the future in such a way that the future will look like the past. And what happened? for Boeing is that over the last few decades, each new model of its airplane was safer than the last. So that was the its history, that's what the leadership were thinking, and that's what their perceptions were. So they ignored all the signals coming from within the company, of which there were very many, coming to from, from pilots uh, who are test pilots, coming from engineers, coming from plant managers who are saying, hey, this model of the airplane 737 MAX is not safer than the previous ones it's more dangerous we need more safety we need more testing and they just couldn't imagine it so they fell into this normalcy bias which causes a lot of folks to make a lot of bad decisions i mean how many people in 2007 thought that housing prices would keep going up right <laughs> <laughs> a major crash yes a major crash and that's the same sort of mindset that boeing fell into and that ordinary people fall into all the time they anticipate that the recent future that the recent past, that the recent future will, will look like the recent past, even though often it will not, <laughs> and that's a big problem. They don't anticipate the major changes that might occur, and so they fall into a series of disasters. So that's one example of what happens with a company, and. Each of my articles is meant to solve a typical problem that businesses experience, whether it's a problem for hiring, you know, there are lots of hiring issues that people go through, whether it's a problem with planning, how do you make yep. good strategic planning, whether it's a problem with, let's say, how do you effectively negotiate, whether with a business partner, whether with a trade union, and so on, what are the kind of errors we make. And each of my articles deals with a specific business situation, so I don't go from the you know, brain side to the business situation. I look at the business situation. I mean, I've done, I've been doing consulting, coaching, and training for the last 20 years. So I take case studies from what my clients see as their biggest challenges, and I write them up without yeah. naming the clients. <laughs> no, of course, which is great. And you mentioned, yes. um, you know, that 20-year career. Um, you know, looking at that, you now obviously CEO of disaster avoidance experts and things like that. But just tell us a little bit more about that career, you know, w without naming names or anything, you know, share with um, the listeners a couple of examples maybe of um, maybe some of the worst decisions that you've seen or, um, you know, some of the commonest ones that maybe listeners are making right now. Hmm. I'll tell you about one that comes from actually failing to see a good decision or yeah. failing to see the decision that needed to be made. So there was a CEO who was a coaching client of mine. Yeah. And the reason he came to me for coaching was a serious situation in his company where what happened was that he suddenly, his company was doing pretty well and it was about a hundred people or so. It was doing pretty well and then started doing less well without the external environment shifting in any serious way. It was a manufacturing company yeah. in the Midwest here in the US. Things didn't really shift, but the company started losing sales, losing customers, and he went to his VP of sales, said, hey, what's going on? The VP of sales said, hey, I'm taking care of it. You know, it's just a glitch. You know, everything will be fine. And, you know, a couple of months, the VP of sales actually very suddenly left and went to his competitor and started stealing directly clients and customers and Ouch. so on, leads. Yeah. And that was pretty terrible. Now, what happened with the my who the person who became my client, the CEO, began investigating, and he found that the VP of Sales was feeling pretty resentful for the last year because he was passed over th for the COO position, and he didn't. The CEO didn't notice at the time that the VP of Sales was feeling resentful, but the VP of Sales was so resentful that he decided to pass on information, secret insider information about clients to the competitor and eventually went jumped ship to the competitor who hired him as the COO of the yes. company. And so this, what happened was after he realized what happened, he saw, he thought, was thinking back and yeah. he realized 
There were so many signs, so many signs that the VP of sales was resentful, but the CEO failed to see them, failed to recognize them because he trusted this VP of sales. This was his person who was with him for over 20 years. So with this sort of relationship, what tends to happen is excessive trust, excessive optimism, and excessive confirmation bias. The confirmation bias is a specific dangerous judgment error where we tend to look for information that supports our beliefs and yeah. ignore information that does not support our beliefs. Yeah, so it's easier to accept it and believe it than challenge it. We call yes. them red flags here. You know, there's a red flag around that. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we make it, I, I can think of a dozen things where I'm thinking, God, I should have seen that. You know, it doesn't matter, but yep. it, 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 it's amazing how that's the case, isn't it? And um, would you say, you know, to the second part of my question, that that is um, a common thing that people do as well? Is the two yes. examples in one there where, you know, using that confirmation bias, you know, where it's like, okay, well, I'm, actually, I've known I've known this person for 20 years, they never do that or whatever. But is it, is, it, is it a leadership thing where they're just not understanding the team? They're not digging deep enough? Is it because we're distracted by being busy? Is there a cause to this usually that, um, you know, why confirmation bias happens or is it just fear full of challenging. Tell us more. What's your thoughts? So what happens here is why our gut is not to be trusted. This is the yeah, classic really example is. of why our gut is not to be trusted. And here's the actual science behind this. We have to understand the science. So our gut is actually not adapted to the current business environment, the current <laughs> professional environment. It's adapted, evolutionarily adapted, to the environment of our, of our ancestors. When we lived in a savanna environment, of small groups of hunters and gatherers and foragers of 15 people to 150 people. So it was very important for us to be very tribal in that environment. We needed to support our tribe because if we were kicked out of our tribe, we would die. And if our tribe fell apart, it would die. So right now we tend to trust people who we perceive to be in our tribe much more than they deserve to be trusted. So, so we, truth, I can, I, I'm thinking of one right now when I work with a client and that's up. Absolutely right. Yes. You can see when yep. you describe it that way, it's absolutely right. Yep. So too much trust for people who we perceive to be in our tribe and too little trust for people who are outside of our tribe because it was important to not trust in the Savannah environment those people who are outside of our tribe because they tended to be obviously hostile to our tribe. Yeah. So right, we are the descendants of those who are very tribal in both senses and in our, in our multipolar global cultural environment, multicultural environment, not trusting people who don't look like us, who don't think like us, who don't have our values, that's a bad thing for business. You are not going to get ahead if you trust your gut and don't trust people who are different than you. And you're also going to get, you know, in pretty serious hot water sometimes if you trust people who are close to you too much. Yeah, that's a great way. And you mentioned about the new book, Never Go With Your Gut. Um, it's one of several. Just as quickly before we get into the, the topic a little bit more, uh, we will put the links to uh, Gleb's books there as well into the show notes. Uh, is the book out now or is it new for release? Yes. Yep, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been out since November 2019. It's Perfect. out with a great business publisher called Career Press. Yep. So it's available in bookstores everywhere, um, you know, in the UK, um, in the US. Amazon, yeah, Amazon, I would imagine. Yeah. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Perfect. yeah. All w the usual outlets. Yes, yes all, the, all the usual outlets. And physical bookstores everywhere. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the old fashioned ones, <laughs> although Barnes & Noble. Exactly. So yeah. uh, pick, it, pick it up and never go with your guts. Um, what would I expect out of that book? You know, uh, why is it worth the dollar investment as uh, <laughs> the bookstore would say? <laughs> It's worth it because you get to learn about the 30 most dangerous judgment errors that cause leaders and professionals to make serious bad decisions in their business, in their leadership, in their careers, in their investments. You know, why do we buy, for example, in investments, why do we as human beings tend to buy high and sell low? There was a really, there was a, a study by a large bank that found, I'm not going to name the bank, that found that its best customers, the ones who made the most money in stock market, were those those who A, forgot about their investments, or B, were dead. <laughs> <laughs> Just let them run. Absolutely. Yes. So that's certainly one for my reading list. It'll be on my bookshelf next week. It'll be an Amazon order after this show, because I'm really keen. And if you, like um, most business, should be on, you know, having your finger on the pulse, being assertive, um, moving forward, the 30 most 
uh, you know, judgmental errors, I think we could all do with that. So head out and pick it up and never uh, go with your gut. Um, obviously, we'll have that out there. We'll put the show notes, uh, the link to the book uh, for Amazon uh, in there as well, as well as uh, I think it's available on your shop as well, isn't it? On your website, uh, on oh, yeah. the store as well. So that's great. So when we get better decision making on the overall topic, I know we've dipped in and out of it, but there's sort of five key things we're going to talk about now. If you want to learn more about um, the sort of decision making, you can head over and connect with Glenn on LinkedIn. Uh, again, we'll put that link in there. Shoot me a message, use the hashtag the open mic. We can get you introduced to Glenn if you need that. Um, and just shoot us a question. What I'd love to know is what is your best decision and what's your worst decision? I'd love you to engage a conversation. We'll share that with you. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you feel that there's something confidential you can't share, shoot me a direct message on LinkedIn and we'll take it out of the public domain. I'll be more than happy to engage in a conversation with you. And, you know, I'd just be keen to hear what that is. So we've talked about Boeing, Gleb, we've talked about the blockbusters, we've talked about these, you know, Fortune 500 company equivalents. Um, so this is, you know, if you're an entrepreneur out there, small, getting started, micro scale up, you know, VC mm -hmm. back, doesn't matter, really. You know, it's happening at all levels, this. It's, it's not exclusive to a specific demographic. Um, so I know we've touched on that, but tell us a little bit more about the importance of addressing, you know, those dangerous judgment errors and not just to let them go and think, oh, I'll sort that tomorrow. You know, I, I would imagine getting hold of these quickly and, 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 and thoroughly is the right way to go. It is very much so. And I'll give you an example from my life. Yeah. So from dangerous judgment errors in my life, and that's specifically important to entrepreneurs. So I run a small company of six people, disaster avoidance experts at disasteravoidanceexperts.com, training, consulting, coaching, content creation. Now, most entrepreneurs have a dangerous judgment errors, which I tend to fall into as well, called the optimism bias. Yeah. So the optimism bias causes me and other people like me to have to be risk blind, to to see the future as bright, as wonderful, as great, and have too high expectations for myself and for others around me. And, you know, I think the grass is green on the other side of the hill, even though it's too often yellow. <laughs> and there are lots of entrepreneurs who are like me. And this is one of the biggest reasons for the failure rate being so high. Because if you are optimistic about the future of your company, then you're going to be too optimistic about the products you create. You know, when you look at the, num at the actual reasons why entrepreneurs fail, the two biggest reasons are failure of fit of your product which you love and you're optimistic about to the marketplace so Got that's the market fit yep yep and the second biggest one is running out of cash yeah. <laughs> and that happens again because you're too optimistic about how quickly you will not burn out of cash you'll not burn for your runway so these are huge problems that entrepreneurs tend to run into like me and this is one of the biggest things that you need to fight and you need to address and so here's how i fight it i have people i hired people on my team who have the opposite bias it's called the pessimism bias. And then it's yeah. on a spectrum. You have people who are extremely optimistic, moderately optimistic, moderately pessimistic, extremely pessimistic. It's all on a spectrum. So this is very helpful for me because it's very hard for me to evaluate the quality of my ideas. I have 20 ideas before breakfast and I think all of them are brilliant. <laughs> and there are many, many entrepreneurs like me. And unfortunately, one of the biggest challenges with entrepreneurs is they tend to hire people who they click with, who they like. You know, I click with other optimists. I don't click with pessimists. I like people who have 20 ideas before breakfast. You know, I like shooting the breeze with them. But if I hire them into my company, That's then they'll, yeah, because then we'll all, they will not complement my strengths. They will actually exacerbate my weaknesses because they'll say, yeah, yeah, these are brilliant ideas. Let's go ahead with them. That's pretty great. But when I hire pessimists, what happens is that I pass my ideas to the pessimist, person who I trust, obviously. And the pessimist says, you know, hey, these are all half-baked potatoes. Maybe these three are worth baking further. And that, and they actually address the problems in these ideas, and then we can implement those three ideas. Because Pessimists are terrible at coming up with new ideas. They see the exaggerated flaws in all of them, but they're great at fixing the problems in existing ideas. You know, I'm the writer, they're the editor. That's kind of the, so the, the dynamic. So that is what you need to have. You need to have people on your team on who line. address your weakness. Yep, 
who and that is very counterintuitive goes very much against your gut to hire those people and work with those people but you need to do that and that's a specific example of how you address a specific cognitive bias and there are techniques to address a number of them at once but this is a specific way that you address a specific problem very common to entrepreneurs no oh, that's great and uh, as you were speaking there Clevy, it flashes back because we, we took a business public in 2004 and mm-hmm. um, we'd got a team and we were you know growing 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 you know pre the, the 2007 eight you know crash yeah. uh, and we were in finance we're in real asset finance and um, you know recollections flash back there because we got these great ideas you know bear in mind we we'd got an online quoting system and an online document approval system in 2004 oh, now, wow. you might now you might be saying today as, as the listeners hey so what the date that's 2004 yeah. you know facebook then, still a, yes you know, um, you know um facebook was a college college campus product yeah. linkedin twitter that didn't exist social the smartphone didn't exist that was a big deal for us um but the, to get back to the point, we were very creative and very innovative. Uh, but Melanie, our FD, our finance director, um, she used to sit there and say, "Whoa, take let's take a step back. You know, this is great." And you know, mm. we, we think. And she, and the way I used to describe it, um, Melanie was the conscience of the business. Um, she used to hold us account to, you know, are we yeah. is that the best use of our time or the best use of the mm. cash that we have to invest in this? And it did work well. Sometimes you get frustrated, like, "Oh, you know, this is going to work. Stop holding us back." You know, <laughs> but but ultimately, when I look back over the eight to nine, nearly ten years I worked with Melanie. Um, nine times out of ten, it was the right call to challenge that, and mm-hmm. you know, and to to get that balance, which is a great. So, you know, again, I'd love to know, um, you know, if you've got that dynamic in your business, use the hashtag the open mic. Um, do you have that? You know, let's call it the creative side and the challenger side. You know, and, and you mm-hmm. know, I know Gleb talks about the pessimism side and, and, and things like that, but uh, let's just see if you've got that. Do you have it, or are you, have you got it all your own way? And you know, how's that working out for you? We'd be keen to understand that. Thanks for sharing that, Clive. That's awesome. So as we move forward, how to overcome that cognitive biases? Um, you know, I know we've just talked there about uh, all the things and, you know, the importance around that, and we've touched on it in and out. So just tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So if people are recognizing cognitive biases, um, is there a framework, a strategy, mm-hmm. is there, you know, something that they can really say, right, enough's enough, I'm going to address this. So there are two things two techniques that you can use. One for quick decisions, casual decisions that you don't want to screw up. These are everyday decisions. These are not, you know, release the new product decisions. These are not start a new company, change your career decisions, you know, move to a different place. These are decisions that you're doing at an everyday level that you don't want to screw up. So minimizing problems, addressing risks. It's a quick technique, takes five, takes two minutes to work through. There is a separate technique that has eight steps. That's going to be for major thorough decisions that you are really impactful for your bottom line, hugely impactful. But let's talk about the quick one first. Entrepreneurs have to make a lot of quick decisions and they screw them up very often. (laughs) And so you don't want to do that. So first question you want to ask about any decision that you're trying to not screw up. What important information haven't I yet fully considered? So what evidence aren't you taking into account? Let's say you're writing an important email to a client and you want to convince the client to do something that you would like the client to do. Now, something that you might not be taking into account is why the client would not do the thing that you want them to do because it's uncomfortable you have to go outside of your comfort zone this is all about going against your intuition going against your gut going against your going outside of your comfort zone but if you actually consider why the client might not want to do the thing that you want them to do you can address their concerns in the email and that's going to make a much more effective email than if you just ignore it and hope the client doesn't see the concerns yeah, so that's why one brilliant Two, what dangerous judgment errors or cognitive biases haven't you considered? So you want to learn about these cognitive biases. My book is one way to do that. There's a list of cognitive biases on Wikipedia. The hundred, There's over 100 of them. My book talks about the 30 most dangerous ones in business and how to address them. Next, what would a trusted and objective advisor tell you to do? So think about that tr- little angel on your shoulder. You know, if you tweet the hashtag, or the open mic, you know, what would Mike tell you to do in this situation? <laughs> <laughs> so think about well, that. The, the answer is go to Gleb and ask Gleb and hire him. It'll be great. He'll let us <laughs> that out for you. <laughs> That's right. So think about that. So who would a, what would a trusted and objective advisor tell you to do? 
Fourth, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So imagine that whatever you're doing has completely failed and then think about all the reasons why it failed and how you can prevent them in advance. So let's say this email that you're writing to a client. Maybe the client was in a bad mood. Maybe they just, you know, had a bad burger or something like that. <laughs> you know, some bad fish and chips. So they're in a bad mood. They get your email. They read it. They have a hostile interpretation of it, of any ambiguities and clarities, and then they don't do what you want. So how can you address that? Well, try to read it from a bad mood perspective. Imagine what you would read it as a client who's in a bad mood yeah. and address anything that's ambiguous that can be interpreted in a negative way reframe it to be as positive as possible and as clear as possible. Yeah, that's right. And finally, last question, what new evidence would cause you to change your mind? So what would cause you to reconsider your decision? So let's say with the email with a client, you can, say, you can say, if I don't hear back from the client within a week, I will call the client on the phone. Yeah. Now, if you- I love the tip there about, you think of it from the environment that the person receiving it's uh, looking yes. at it. You know, are yep. they in a bad mood? Are they in a good mood? You know, we don't always know. And, you know, sometimes I know, I know over my 25, six, seven year career, I've made calls to people who were really nice and they've really bitten my ear off. And I'm thinking, well, what have I done wrong? And it just happens that I'm having a bad day and I just happen to be that person who got yep. it. So it doesn't always mean that case. But, you know, but again, this idea, sorry, these recollections where I can see that happening. And, and you, you know, like you say, read it from that perspective. I think that's a great piece of advice. Thank you for sharing. You're very welcome. So, yeah, so these questions are the ones that you want to ask yourself for addressing any sort of decision that you don't want to screw up, any sort of casual decision. Like I said, you know, sending an email to a client is a casual decision, daily one that you don't want to screw up. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that leads on to why not going with your gut is the best move. It's, it's thinking about it. And, you know, so if there's an urge, right, my gut says this is right, you know, let's reverse this out. I'm sure it's in the book and I'm looking forward to reading that. But, um, you know, it, it was like, my gut says this right, I can feel it. You know, as an entrepreneur, my gut's there, you know, if you get that urge to do that, um, you can go through these steps, of course, that we've talked about. Is there anything else that the listeners can do to sort of prevent them from self-harming, uh, you know, and uh, getting it wrong? So that's the, the, so for casual decisions, that's the steps that you want to go yeah. through. And that's, a, that's what you want to make sure to go through. Now, if you're doing a big thing and you know, that urge might come from a big thing, there's an eight step process that yeah. you want to use for all serious decisions that you don't want to screw up. The first, ident and that you want to actually get as perfect as possible because they're really serious. Yeah. So first, identify the need for a decision to be made. And this is a surprising one. Many people are shocked, you know, why do I identify the need for a decision to be made? Well, a lot of people don't identify, let's say, a change that's happening in the external context. For example, the Me Too movement has gotten more and more powerful Absolutely. recently. And a lot of people don't understand and realize the impact on the company. I mean, let's say Uber huge major company had a great deal of money but it didn't realize that the me too movement was getting more and more powerful and it wasn't addressing the sexual harassment culture that it was too accepting of sexual harassment within the company that resulted in a number of lawsuits and eventually the ceo was forced out for yeah. the ceo and founder was forced out so that's an example of where a decision was not identified so you didn't identify the need for a decision to be made so that's a big problem next step Step two, gather relevant information on the issue from informed perspectives, especially people with whom you disagree. So if you have, if you're an optimist, which many entrepreneurs are, make sure to go to pessimists. If you're a pessimist, which many people in the financial role are, the accountant role are, make sure to go to an optimist. Get people's perspectives who disagree with you. You don't have to do what they say, but you should listen to them and incorporate it into your decision. Yeah, great advice. I love that. Paint a clear vision of the desired outcome. So if you're creating a business, let's say you're launching an enterprise, what do you want to see happen in five years from now? What would you like to see happen? And plan backwards from that, from that clear vision, the goals, to make the right decisions now to get yourself into the future. So this is a big challenge that many entrepreneurs don't do sufficiently. And they tend to try to invest too fast and too much into growth. And that's one of the major reasons they run out of runway, that they try to invest too fast, too quickly into growth, as opposed to thinking, well, where do I want to be five years from now? And how should I invest my resources to be where I want to be five years from now? Yeah. 
Next, develop clear decision-making criteria to evaluate options. Let's say you as an entrepreneur are making a key hire. What are your criteria for this key hire? So somebody, somebody, let's say they're fit in the company, their expertise in the business, obviously the salary that they want. Think about all of these criteria and how important are they to you? You know, if you have a lot of money for you know, some reason you're an entrepreneur, you had just had a very successful VC round, perhaps money won't be so important to you. So on a scale of one to 10, you know, say that money is five, but you really want someone who has a lot of expertise. And so you'll say that's a 10 and fit in the company is pretty important to you. So you'll say that that's an eight. And then you can weigh these things against each other. Perfect. Then you want to generate viable options. That's five, step five to achieve your goals. And here, this is a crucial one. This is one where very many leaders get wrong. They satisfy. They go for the first viable option. They settle and they move onward. Now, in the previous one, the five question one, that's great. That's fine. That's where you want to avoid risks. But here, you don't simply want to avoid risks. You want to maximize rewards. And for this step, it's bad to simply settle. So you want at least five viable options. Then weigh these using the criteria you have before and pick the best of the bunch. Some people might have be better on salary. Some people might be better on fit. Some people might be better on expertise. If you say that expertise is the most important thing, then you want to make sure to weigh those who have more expertise yeah, higher. Put the weight in into that, absolutely. Exactly, exactly. Next, yep. seven, implement the option you chose. Now, there are two steps here. There are two sub-steps. The first one is similar to question four from the previous one. Think about what would happen if this option failed, if this hire failed, Think about why it might have failed and how you can address it in advance. Now, the other step here, because this is one you want to maximize success, is think about this hire succeeding. How would this hire succeed? What are all the reasons for this hire succeeding, this decision succeeding, and how can you get there? So, for example, let's say you're an entrepreneur and you're hiring someone who is not very entrepreneurial, but who's someone who has a lot of experience in the field because that person has a big contact network and they, that person will help professionalize your organization. So something that will help that person succeed is making sure that they are a fit for the culture, which is going to be different than what they're used to. Which is and a big I, thing, isn't it? The culture side of things, because yep, if it's it wrong, it just knocks it out. It's huge. So you want to make sure, especially if this person is not coming from an entrepreneurial culture, but is the professional COO, you want to make sure that this person can adapt to the culture effectively, as opposed to try to impose their own culture on your organization. Yeah. And so that, that's one that you want to maximize success. Then evaluate the implementation process revised as needed. You want to make sure to measure. Here, metrics are very important. Measure the decision. What are the metrics of success for this decision, make sure you have these metrics and evaluate the quality of the decision over time. So how well is this COO adapting to the culture, to the organization? Evaluate this. Don't just let it go. Don't, you know, don't say in a year that this person has not worked out and fire them. <laughs> give them mentoring, give them training, give them support for adapting into the culture, give them guidance. So make sure to have metrics that evaluate success and revise the decision as needed until it's successful. Yeah, that's great. And I'd love to get your take on this. This is an approach that we do in uh, in Jamie's agency side. Um, when we measure analytics um, and performance, and I'm just wondering if this applies uh, and you agree with this or there's a different take. There's, there's no right or wrong here from us. And that is that we want to identify the output of what we're trying to achieve. And whether mm -hmm. that's hiring this person or whatever it would be or, or making a new product launch or whatever. Um, and then so we, 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 we identify the output needed. Then we sort of tag what the outcome should be of mm -hmm. that. But then we break it down into four uh, key things, which is a leading outcome. So what's the early signs that this looks like it's going to be successful? Mm -hmm. And then what's the lagging outcome as it's coming out? Are we still on track? We're not wandered off, you know, if we're trying to get to the moon and we're not, you know, venturing off into deep space. Uh, and then breaking that down again to quantity and quality metrics. And I just wondered if you've come across that, Gleb, where, you know, it's not only what we're trying to achieve as an output and what the outcome should be of that, but, you know, we don't want to get to the year end and find out this guy didn't, was never going to yeah. work or this girl's been awesome already. You know, so it's that leading and lagging outcomes, quantity and quality. And that's how we try and address our assessment of things. Uh, I just got to get your take on that. Do you think that's a smart move? Do you think there's a better way of looking at it? 
Yeah, I think that's a really that makes a lot of sense to me. So having that leading and lagging outcome, yes. Yeah, so it depends on which what your decision is and what you're measuring and how you're measuring. Of course. But that general principle, I think, makes a lot of sense to me. And you'll want to focus also as part of it on evaluating how you not simply how you think about it, but how you feel about it. Because sometimes you want to use your feelings and make sure that you feel that these are appropriate outcomes. Sometimes one of the things I've noticed with measurements that go wrong is that there are some things that are very hard to measure. They're iffy, they're fuzzy. And so you can get to them by saying, how do I feel about this and how do I feel about that? And measuring your feelings, your mood, your perceptions over time. So that's something that I tend to encourage people to build into their processes for challenging people or especially people who are into decisions. So that's, uh, you know, obviously you can look at profits very easily, but whether someone is a fit, that is a much harder thing to measure. So having feelings about this is going to be an important indicator. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we've bounced around on the questions. One thing I just wanted to sort of bring back in is intuition. Um, yeah. You know, just tell us, you know, I know you, you know, uh, intuition and decision making, there's, there's naturally a, a string of benefits to that. And we've been through these steps, which are in the book. And I can highly encourage you to go head out and get the book. Never uh, you know, try, never go with your gut. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Um, and, you know, let us know what you think about that. Uh, but, you know, talk to us a little bit more as we come into the back end and wrapping out of the show um, about applying intuition in decision making. And um, go a little bit deeper for us on that subject, if you could. So the importance of intuition is, first of all, to, to define what it is and understand what it is. It's unfortunately very easy for us to feel that we are going with our experience and learning on something when we're not, like the WeWord debacle and so on. So you, what is intuition? The intuition is when you have learned over time a certain process, a certain pattern, in such a way that you are extremely confident based on extensive feedback that you know the right thing to do in this situation and that you're very likely to be right when you just automatically decide. So that's what intuition is. It's based on you know ten thousand hours of pre probably heard ten thousand hours. Experts, yeah. Yep, that is what the th intuition is that you should trust because if you just feel something is right and then you go forward with it, you know, it feels right when you have a box of dozen donuts to eat that whole that box of dozen donuts. <laughs> Why is that? Well, it, from our savanna background, from our gut reactions, when our ancestors came across some apples or some bananas, it was very important for them to eat as many of those as possible. So we are the descendants of those who have the same gut reactions. Yeah. And it feels just as right to do that as, it, as to look at a, a spreadsheet and immediately judge the profit and loss. Yeah. But in the profit and loss, it's not actually intuition. You're not using your, it's not actually instincts. You're not using your simply gut reaction. You are using a learned pattern of behavior. So you need to identify where you have learned patterns of behavior that enable you to succeed. You can probably very quickly look for your email and decide what's spam or not, right? That is an easy thing to do because you've done it over time and you've been successful. You get very quick feedback at it. When you do hiring, unless you, spend all your day hiring, you are very unlikely to be good at it. I'm yeah. sorry to say. <laughs> no, you're going to make major mistakes, aren't you? You're going to make sure. major mistakes if you don't follow a very clear structured process where you use data and analytics because we make so many mistakes about other people. So this is something that you don't want to trust yourself, even though it feels like you click with someone and you, because you'll just hire other optimists on your team and you will just have, you know, everyone 20 ideas before breakfast and you'll be just going in all directions where you don't need to be going. Yeah, you get so, that imbalance, absolutely. Yep, exactly, That's and it feels, not, it feels very not intuitive to do that. Mm -hmm. So that is the intuition. You want to, look, again, the area where you have made many successful decisions in the past, where you have 10,000 hours of practice, and that's where you can trust yourself to go on autopilot. Yeah, that's great. I love that statement there. Use a 10,000 hour rule to go on autopilot. I love that. That's a great statement. Well, it's been an absolute honor. Um, I do, don't really want this to end. I could have gone and learning more off you all the time, but we are tied up time. I hope you as the listeners have had a, 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 an informative um, 
you know, an understanding about your decision making. Think about your businesses. Think about your life choices. Uh, decision making is there. Doesn't it make sense to put some time, whatever your personal development track is, you know, head out and go and get clubs. But we'll put the link below and you can learn a little bit more about it. And as we wrap out of the show, uh, if we were to summarize, I know it, it, it's pretty hard because it's been so detailed, but if we were to summarize three pro tips of what we've learned, what, you know, the listeners can learn about decision making, what would you summarize there for us? The first thing is to look for information that disproves your beliefs. You yeah. want to try to disprove your beliefs because we have such a big temptation to look for information that confirms that we are doing the right thing. That's yeah. one. Second, get the opinion of a trusted and objective advisor. Very important, very easy to go wrong. Don't do that. So try to think, at least think what would a trust and objective advisor tell you. Would we'll, we'll do, yeah. Yes, and ideally do that. And finally, make sure to imagine how this decision can fail, all the ways it can fail, and imagine that it actually failed, all the ways it could fail, and how you can address these failures in advance. So yeah. these are the three key things. If you only do three things, these are the three things you should do to avoid disasters in your decisions and maximize success. Yeah, that's amazing. And whilst that may in some cases look negative, hey, are we setting out, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's really drilling down. It's really make, uh, making sure that the decisions that you adopt and take forward are going to have a, a better chance of success because there's no guarantees in anything. Yeah. You know, the world can end, you know, as far as like the financial crash, you know, 10 years, yeah. 12 years ago, you know, with these things that I suppose we could have seen that, that I think we're all dreaming and thinking it was going to go on forever mm. and it didn't. Yeah. Um, but ultimately outside of those, um, you know, major situations, that's going to give you a great solid foundation. Gleb, it's been an absolute pleasure to interview you today. The value you've provided is immense. Thank you so much for guesting on the open mic. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on, Mike. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. And for listeners, we appreciate you've got lots of choice in the podcast market. We thank you for tuning in. As always, we appreciate you developing and going forward with your growth engine journey. As always, get in the game, go do the hustle, go make it happen. And we're going to catch up with you on another Open Mic podcast uh, in the coming weeks. Take care. Have a great week, guys. You have been listening to The Open Mic, brought to you by The Success Hub. To find out more and to get the resources we have mentioned in this podcast episode, simply visit blog.thesuccesshub.io and view the podcast section. Thanks for listening and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode. This podcast and associated materials is published under copyright to The Success Hub. All rights reserved. No reproduction of this material is permitted.